So we had four of the guys lined up to come, and then Randy came this morning and brought a guest, so thank you very much. I think this is the first time all five of you have been in one place other than, a, I think, Commodity Classic, if I hear right, so we could be in for some fireworks. Uh, yeah, we need a drum roll, all right? You guys got mics? Everybody's mics working? I have Dan Lipkiss, Matt Swanson, Kevin Kolb, Randy Dowdy. David Hula. Thank you for being here. I'm sure these guys aren't interested in hearing me talk, so I'd like to pass. If you got mics, great. Just like to hear something about you. Like to hear what's going on in your area. And uh, we'll go from there. Hi, I'm Dan Lipkus. Uh, we farm just an hour north of here, northern Illinois. Uh, I don't know what all that is, but we got... Uh, we're just a medium-sized farm, uh, about 1,500 acres, uh, corn, soybeans, and we have some cattle. Um, and nothing special, we just try to do a really good job with uh, the acres we have. Well, Matt Swanson, uh, we're about uh, two hours southwest of here along the Mississippi River. Uh, corn, soybeans, we grow triticale for forage and then have a custom forage harvesting business and some other, some other things. Um, Kevin Cobb from uh, southern Indiana, uh, raised corn, soybeans, and turkeys. Randy Dowdy, Jeff Brown's in the audience. I see a lot of faces I recognize, good deal. Um, Randy Dowdy farm in North Florida and South Georgia. Long ways from home. Uh, we're really, 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 really wet. Been that way for quite some time. So. I don't know if Illinois is glad to see this weather or not, but I think I brought it with me, so you're welcome. Um, I was in Nebraska last week, and it rained like three inches while I was there, and I said, I told you I'd bring the rain. So they were pretty happy they, get, they were able to turn off some pivots. So my good pleasure to be here. I'm the last one. I'm Dave Hewler from Charles City, Virginia, and I pulled up my phone. I'm 886 miles from home. So we, one corn, soy, wheat stuff, but... One neat thing that we take great pride in, we farm the land that the settlers farmed in 1609, the oldest farm ground here in the United States from Western civilization. So you talk about history. And That's we've come a long check, check. way from planting corn with digging a hole and putting a catfish in the ground as your fertility and putting three kernels of corn on top of it. So now we're just trying to stay in front of Randy here now. Seth, what's the story on the mics? I don't know how this happened, but the Illinois boys are on one side and the rest of y'all's over there, so. Yeah, usually it follows the Mason-Dixie line. It's true, true. So anybody harvested yet in this group? Randy, I know you've done a little bit of harvesting. David, have you? Uh, no, we hand shelled some Saturday and it was like 29%, so 31 if it goes through a machine. So we'll probably start Wednesday or Thursday this week. Do you like to usually start up in the high 20s? Um, because we get hurricanes, yeah. We'll typically start about 28% or so. There's no storms out in the ocean right now, so we're kind of being a little bit lackadaisical. So. Appreciate that. Randy, how about, how about you? Uh, we should have been done by the first week in August. Instead, we've still got corn yet to harvest. Um, it's really wet. It's not fun. Uh, we're having to pull trucks in and out with tractors. It's greasy on top. It's slick. Uh, the combine, we've got some 15-inch corn we're planting. Marion Commer here. Where you at, Marion? Marion Commer's, I think, got a booth in the other, in the yep. other room yep. somewhere. And it's hard to keep a 15-inch corn head straight when you're going this way in the field. So we're spinning from one end to the other. Um, it's not fun. We're causing compaction, but the corn's starting to rot in the field. That sucks. We've had over 50 inches of rain since May the 10th. Uh, all farms have had over 40. Some farms have had over 50. Our annual rainfall is 45 to 60 in 12 months. We've had it in three. We got 13 in one event with the tropical storm, and that started it all uh, in May. And it's not been fun. Uh, the joy, I think B.B. King sang a song, The Thrill Is Gone. 
The thrill is gone. Uh, it has not been fun. We've got a crop. We've invested in it. We had a pretty good crop. Uh, we had a crop that uh, defied logic based off the weather and the cloudy days that we've had. But now we can't get it. And it adds insult to injury. Um, it's rotting. We've ha got diplodia. We've got fusarium. We've got sprouting. And test weights going out the window. So luckily we have... Yeah, but your alpha toxin numbers are real high. <laughs> You know, there is a backstop here that won't catch you. Um, <laughs> uh, he mentions alpha toxin. I had a truck get rejected, and we were sending it to a, a facility. I won't call any names. And it was rejected, and they test for over 20 or under 20. It went over 20. So I then take it to somebody that will take it. And... It test, they took it and sent it to the state lab and it tested 400 parts per billion. 400, that's bad. That's not good. The higher the number, not the better, okay? <laughs> and uh, we've, we're blending, uh, we practice what I preach. Anybody that knows me, how many, how many different hybrids I plant in every field we farm? Three to four, at multiple populations. So the good news is we're able to blend varieties and blend some of that grain in the field to try to get it lower. Not all the varieties took it on the chin, but some won't be back for this reason because we don't know what kind of weather we're going to have and when it's going to be this way. So unfortunately we have harvested some, we're not finished. That means our double crop options is now out of the window. Uh, we won't get to plant those acres because it's now too late. Um, unless we knew we had a, our first frost at Christmas, um, we, we've lost that opportunity. So. Unfortunately, it is what it is, and we got crop insurance. Hopefully, that'll be a backstop for us, and maybe I can survive again and do it again next year. On a positive note, I've heard you before, and since I'm clear at the end of the stage, I've heard you say that the best way to pay for irrigation is not have to turn it on. So I don't. <laughs> that is a fact. <laughs> Uh, that is a fact. We did harvest some very good dryland corn this year. Um, that, that was, a, or I guess, a shiny moment for us. Um, but the irrigated, absolutely, our irrigation costs are pretty low compared to normal. Um, my home farm, I normally pump. Now, we did not have corn there. We had peanuts there this year for rotation. It's the first time since 2008 it hadn't had corn on it in some capacity. And read between the lines, big boy. We are doing a little bit of rotation just for you. And um, we're getting it out of that, we're breaking that cycle. And we had peanuts there, and we hadn't had to turn the, pivot, the pivots on all year. We normally pump 20 to 25 inches a year. They hadn't been turned on once, not once. It's that much rain. And the ground is, you ever smell ground that smells like it's rotten? You ever smell ground? That's what it smells like. You dig it up and it smells like it's sour, stale, like it's rotten, that's what we've got right now. I so. thought that's what Kevin had for chicken litter, for turkey litter. <laughs> I've got a little bit of that. No, Kevin farms up there in, where the land flows with milk and honey. I think they talked about him in the Old Testament, um, farming some of that land. Um, he could take his ground and fertilize mine. All these Illinois boys and, and Indiana guys could do that. Um, they're rain-fed crops. They don't even need your guess. They get all they want. And, that's pretty well the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Make 300 bushel corn and not even try. I wouldn't go quite there, but pretty close. No. So, uh, well, I don't know what I was going to say now. <laughs> Could have been that important. Well, he said he never turned on one of the irrigators, but I saw him on TV with the, out there in the 100% gnats making that young man roll but, the tire well, out of the back That's what I was going to say, but you notice who was doing the point, the finger yeah. point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Kevin, how's things where you're at? Uh, we're we're doing pretty good. We lost had a kind of rough um, June for us. Um, we lost some river bottom flooding, um, but you know uh, we're a little dry, not too bad. But we're probably close to three weeks out before we really know. There's a few guys uh, shelling some. Uh, 110 day corn on pure sand. Um, it's a little under what they expected or what their average was, but it's sand, so uh, I don't know. I can tell you here in about three weeks what it's going to do. 
are you and Sean fighting over who gets gets which field? Because Sean was the uh, first place non -air, or in the uh, strip till, is that right? Yeah. And um, you were first place. She, in the, I've learned. Uh, Sean's she pretty, his wife, in case you didn't know that. She pretty well um, takes what she wants. <laughs> <laughs> Amen yeah, to that. That's just saying it nice. <laughs> Matt, how, how are you? Well, we're uh, the third consecutive year. It hasn't rained in June, so uh, that hurt our, our potassium uptake quite a bit. But uh, because we were jacking around building a new planter, uh, we were about two, three weeks later than everybody else was, and I think that two or three weeks may be the difference this year between average corn and, and maybe significantly above average. So we'll see how it finishes here, and probably got five weeks before we're ready to go, I would say. Yeah, but stand was improved and all that stuff. Yeah, uh, we built that new planter, uh, basically tore it down to row unit frames and started over. And uh, I don't think we've ever had a stand of corn. We switched to 15 inch rows this year. And uh, I don't think we've ever had a stand like we've got right now, so. Is everything you have on that row spacing? Uh, we had to, well, we traded combines when we traded planters, so we had to change heads, so. Uh, we're basically 95% 15-inch corn, but 80% of our ground is, is light, what I call light clay. It's light colored, doesn't hold water well. It kind of turns into adobe when it gets hot. Um, but based on what that corn looks like now versus what it normally does, I think that's going to be a... We may have a record farm average, but it's not going to be because our good ground's good. It's going to be because our poor ground is a lot better. Are you sandbagging? Maybe. <laughs> He can't sandbag. He's on Twitter all the time. <laughs> there you go. I, I think Kevin forwarded me a text. He was going to make five to 600 bushel corn on the outside edges and 350 bushel field average. Is that right? I think, I think the strips will do that, yeah. The corn bean strips, yeah. Really? That's impressive. But Kevin said something a moment ago. You said she pretty much gets what she wants. Is that what you said? I want to go back to that. I, uh, I, I, I missed that. I didn't have a microphone at the time. What does that mean? Uh, <laughs> she takes what she wants. It means it's probably good she's not here. Yeah. Not. Are they at home in a jar? Is that what you're telling uh, me? Pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a big jar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dan, how about you? <laughs> oh, we're... Oh, We've had pretty good rainfall. We got uh, we got a real good crop coming. Uh, we had we did have some issues uh, with the July heat right around the Fourth of July when some of the earlier stuff was pollinating. We did uh, we did lose a little bit on pollination, and we we got some tip back that we can't really figure out why we had it. But um, overall, I would say we probably, we're probably going to have our highest on farm uh, yield average. Um, I don't know as far as like the contest stuff is record. I don't know if we're any better than we were before, but I think overall we've got a really good crop as most of the guys do in Northern Illinois where we're at. So I think the only thing I seen where uh, I had some dry land acres that, um, you know, we kind of have our program that we don't, we don't push them as hard because we have a yield goal, maybe, maybe 250, 260 on those, those particular farms. And there was a potential with the rainfall this year that they could have done over three, but being we probably didn't have enough nutrient load out there because I wasn't shooting for three that we actually backed off and they're firing a little bit for nitrogen deficiency. Um, and that was, just, that was just my own management call, not hitting it right that time. But the stuff that we gave uh, enough, enough to, we're looking pretty good on. So each of you guys, and you can hop in as you want to, is there something that you lack every year as far as a, that you really battle? I mean, here it's zinc, sulfur, those types of things. Do each of you have the same battle every year with the same nutrient? If we're going to assume we take the weather out of the equation, sunlight has been air trial, trouble this year. Yeah, it's something we can't control. There's no sunlight in a bottle yet. But then, I mean, I imagine we probably all have similarities, but it's just a managing and keeping it well balanced um, from a standpoint of sulfur, boron, iron, you know. We can address all those, it's just a matter of getting it, having the framework to get it started and then finish it. Most people just run out of, run out of steam with the tail end. 1,000% for me is sunlight. Um, we get a lot of cloudy days and 
obviously you want to make big yields that we can't make it in here this long and we can't necessarily put two ears on every stalk so we just got to have a lot of plants for a lot of years and to do that the greater the population the more you pay a penalty when the sunlight's not there when the solar radiation goes down you pay the biggest penalty on the high pops that's part of probably why matt spreading risk on the, the crop interstripping because you do get some advantage from that there's no question um, we're, we're doing some interstripping with the next level group in nebraska and I'd be willing to bet that based on what I saw last week in the plots out there, um, there's no question that interstripping will be the highest yields over everything that they have going on. And they've got a lot going on. It all pops, different management styles, techniques, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> probably the 1,000 pound gorilla here. Who's been pulling soil or tissue samples every year? Who's been pulling tissue samples weekly? Who started pulling some tissue samples and, it, and they got you kind of scratching your head a little bit? Y'all seeing some of that? Um, the thing that I see the most with some of the groups that we're working with, 100%, um, is there's magnesium deficiencies, yet there's copious amounts in the soil, period. There's, you know, you look at base saturations, it's there. You look at, you know, copious amounts just as far as elemental pounds or parts per million in the soil, yet when you look at the, the tissue samples, magnesium seems to be part of the limiting factor. And then how is that possible? How can you have all of this magnesium in the soils, have plenty of it, based off what we understand, yet the, the levels be you know, deficient in the tissue samples? So that's, that's part of what is driving me to learn. Um, anybody watch America's Got Talent? You ever see the golden buzzer, where they, at the end of the show they get to go to the live shows? If we can figure that out, why magnesium levels are having that problem consistently across the Midwest, that's going to be a big deal. Why is magnesium important? Does anybody know that answer? Magnesium is the center of the chlorophyll molecule. That's a big deal. What drives photosynthesis? There you go. What drives yield? There you go. Photosynthesis. We've got to make as many sugars as we can, as starches as we can, we need that sugar and starches to be transferred to what? The grain that we sell. So how can we have plenty of it and ignore it in our tissue samples? Now, who don't know? Who has not put a tissue sample, or at least walked their fields and identified a magnesium deficiency based off of a visual stimulus, or at least through a tissue sample? Most of us in this room. Ignorance is bliss, right? We don't worry about the things we don't know. But once we figure out there is a problem, then how do we correct it? So that, to me, that's the thing I struggle with every year, and I think a lot of guys in the Midwest are struggling with, is how do we correct that? There's some kind of imbalance there, and then we've got to fix that problem. Matt, I know you've talked about on the show you're changing your fertility plan again this year. You've said that before. What's driving that decision? Well, we have high mag soils like a lot of people do. Um, for whatever reason, we generally don't have magnesium issues in our tissue samples. Um, generally, the guy that looks, for, looks at them for me tells me they're too high. But we have iron issues or we have potassium issues that, that we can't seem to solve. So part of the, our changes this year were to try to solve some of those potassium issues hey, specifically. Matt, just so they could be clear, kind of what kind of levels are you talking about so they understand? On the magnesium portion? Yeah. Well, Paul looks at them for me, so you'd have to ask Paul. You mean on the soil? You mean the soil test or the? Well, you just mentioned that they like were in the high, base, like the so base saturation. We're over seventy percent on okay. almost everything. What are they on the tissue? You mentioned the tissue samples are running high. So on the numbers we get back from Paul, he's running about one hundred twenty or one hundred thirty percent of what he'd like to see. So that's Paul Bodenstein for those not. What are the actual levels? What are the actual levels on the tissues? You know that answer? I tell you real quick. Because that when when somebody says they're high. I want to cue in on that, and I want to clue in on it in a bad way because he may be having a, an answer to a solution I just talked about, right? So I listen, and I'd love to hear when you say that they're high, higher than what normal is or higher than what they should be. So While he's looking that up, Dan, how about you? Any issues you're fighting? Uh, I would go along with what Randy would say on the magnesium I mean we have uh, we have quite a bit of available we've changed our calcium to magnesium ratios by applying calcium uh, high cal lime and gypsum have tried to tweak it that way but even though we're still at a higher level 
uh, we're showing we are showing deficient in uh, tissue samples. Now we're trying to remedy that with uh, we're switching uh, to KMag on some things. I think we've seen some out of that. I notice uh, tissues looking a little bit better this year by switching to that. We're getting away from potassium chloride. Um, so, you know, we're struggling with that. I think everybody always struggles with boron. We just keep applying boron. Boron's very soluble. It goes away pretty fast. Um, that and, and uh, manganese, uh, we started applying dry manganese sulfate, uh, and that seems, to be, uh, that seems to be helping us and working in our tissue samples. But those are the things that we've been fighting. Is there a certain time that you're doing that? Are you doing that through the irrigation? The, uh, the K-Mag, uh, that was a dry applied in the spring, but I did try to get some soluble K-Mag through a supplier in season that we were going to put through our drip system, and there was a hiccup, and Nagy was pretty upset about it. It was one of them things that's going to, supposed to be there in three days, and a month later I'm still hounding them for it, and I finally told them to keep it. But, I, but my samples, are, I wish I would have told them to keep it coming because they, they got pretty low. So everybody here's irrigation except for Kevin and Matt. Do you have some irrigation? No. No. Okay. You got one pivot. No. <laughs> now, now, Kevin, you told me you had one pivot. We have seen worked on a pivot. You worked on a pivot. Yes, we. We're we supposed to work with a pivot. We no. do the working on. <laughs> the the pivots. The, oh. Yeah, there you go. No. Uh, How do you think its dry land yields are so good? It's that mysterious. <laughs> now, it's now wait a minute. It, it didn't really run right. all year. Now, <laughs> now wait a minute. I got something to say. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. David Hula's son. Whoa. Um, Your future son-in-law. I'm hoping. No, don't put that on film. But, but uh, he come down to see us. Spend a little time on the farm there. And the first thing out of his mouth was, I can't believe this is what you farm. You know, the, it's not what he said, so, or what he thought. You know, when you come to southern Indiana, it's not like northern Indiana. You know, uh, small patches, uh, it's not quite the honey hole that uh, Mr. Dowdy uh, claims that we uh, Okay, I got four have. to seven CECs, and my organic matter is less than 1%. Yeah, but you got the hula pile. <laughs> I do have a little pile, but it's still sitting in a pile. Uh, hadn't been spread. That's for 2019, just for you. But no, four to seven CECs and organic matter, organic matter is less than 1%. He's got an unlimited turkey litter supply. Well, free yeah. manure. <laughs> Actually, he's I got a, he's got a um, CECs of what? Um, between 14 and 18. 14, 18, and organic matter is where? About percent and a half. Percent and a half? Yeah. And you got a water table about what? Oh, it's three dry. And a, three and a half it's feet? It's dry right now. Three and a half feet below the root zone? Well, we are, big, let's talk about it. Their <laughs> problems are them guys. Um, they have to put irrigation up. And if he would be like us and put some tile in, that would fix some of his problems that yeah, he's having yeah, this yeah. year. Where are we going to send it to? Where are we going to send it back? The Gulf? The Gulf. There you go. <laughs> so, um, uh, no, no question, where we needed tile, tile has paid. Um, but we have rolling terrain, we have some slope with grade on it. Um, our water doesn't sit for a long period of time. I mean, it moves off, but with that goes erosion, right? And that's part of why the cover crops are such a big deal for us to, to help hold the world together. But our organic matter levels are so low because it, you know, we get, I was asked, I think Kevin asked me before we got started, how many days do we freeze? We get, um, Last year in 2017, we had, I think, five days where we dropped below 50 degrees soil temps. Five. Five, degree, five days where our soil temps dropped below 50 degrees. That's why y'all come to the south in the wintertime, right? It's warm. That's the way it normally works. And then in, in 20, the winter of 2017, or I guess 2018, um, we were running anywhere 15 to 18 days where we actually dropped below 50 degrees. So our mineralization process just constantly is just driving. I mean, it, it, we, our microbial activity, you know, it just never stops. So the, the, the cover crops last for a period of time, but once the crop gets growing in the spring, we kill it, uh, they're going within 30 to 45 days. And we're planting in the mat this deep. And in 45 days, you can't find it. Our double crop on corn, we harvest corn, and when we harvest that corn, 
you know, we'll plant double crop beans or peas behind it, and by the time that we harvest the peas or beans by Thanksgiving or Christmas, you can't find a corn cob in the field. 90 days ago. So our microbial activity just, he says we're living in the Garden of Eden. I don't, I, I think we got two different interpretations there. <laughs> I want to touch on something with it. Uh, there is a difference between a lot of the people in this room, if you're a Midwestern farmer, is uh, that we have dealt with basically just commercial fertilizer for the last 40 years. Maybe there was some cattle manure injected into it, but for the most of the time, we don't have the supply of poultry litter or turkey litter. So not that we wouldn't love to use it, hell, we all would, but uh, we've had to do it with commercial fertilizers. And the problem with commercial fertilizers is, is they're salts. Take a cup of potassium chloride, dump it on the grass, and you're going to kill that grass. If you take a cup of manure, dump it on there, it's going to grow green and four foot tall. That's a very simplistic way of showing what you're doing to your soil biology. So we have kind of trying to back off on some of the salts and chlorides and ramping up our biological activity to make the ground do more of the work. Um, it's, it's still, even without the manure, I mean, this is, we're trying to make the worms and everything give us some of their manure. We're trying, to, we're trying to increase that. And we're seeing we are increasing it. We've also found that there's some negatives to it. One of them is, uh, uh, by increasing my biological activity, I've noticed that I ramped up actually a white mold infestation because that's also biological activity. So there's, as you learn and change things, there's things that you have to tweak along the way. But uh, it, it's definitely different for us up here working with commercial fertilizer and trying to do the same things that you can with manure. It's, you have to kind of change your way of thinking. I mean, I would, I mean, Dan, would you agree that, I mean, in, in, large, in a lot of cases, we have more than enough of what we need, we just can't get it out. So the biggest focus for us is trying to pull stuff out of the ground that we already have. And that's the reason for ramping up the biological yep. activity to keep, I mean, you've got a lot of potash probably available and uh, even more so phosphorus probably, and it's just getting it out of the ground, getting the microbes to work, getting them to do the work so the plant can uptake. Uh, what you need. You brought up the biologicals. Are any of you using biologicals or are all of you using biologicals? If so, when, where, how, how, how are you doing that? In furrow, foliar? Well, on the East Coast, like Randy said, we got a lot of biological activity. So things want to go back to nature. So if you start introducing new stuff, eventually there's going to be a battle zone going on down in there and the bigger always wins typically but we do treat our seed with inoc we inoculate both their corn and their soy we're also um, putting inoculants in fur and then we focus on feeding what's naturally there as well whether it's with zinc humic and fulvic acids sugars you know, those, whether it's sugar or molasses or something, but we try to keep what's naturally there, make that population higher. And then we introduce some new stuff just to try something new. All right, as far as I'm concerned, um, we've played around with a lot of different products. Here's my problem. Um, number one, who has sent their soil off for a test and actually had an analysis done where they identified all of the biological activities, their numbers, which ones are beneficials, which ones are in balance, and which ones are out. Who's done that? Who's got that data? But everybody always sells you something stating, well, you're gonna get three bushel ROI or four bushel ROI. Okay, the products that you sold me, is that native biology to my soils or Midwest soils? Which one do you think it came from? My soils or Midwest soils? Or some kind of medium that they grew it. So my question is, we talked about magnesium, something's probably out of balance why you can have a lot in the soil, yet it's tied up. You can have a lot in the soil, yet you can't get it into the plant, something's not in balance. So here's my theory. Instead of taking, since Mother Nature takes care of itself, and God's been growing corn longer than we have, I'm a believer in less stimulating the plant bugs we have. Let's stimulate the soil bugs that we have, not plant bugs, the soil biology that we have. Let's stimulate that. 
Because if it takes care of itself and goes back to nature, then how do I know I'm not introducing an invasive species to us naturally there? So I'm interested in stimulating the plant biology or soil biology that's there, let it do its heavy lifting, and we do that exactly like David said. Human convolvic sugars, giving them a carbon source, an energy source, zinc, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's what we do. We look at more of influencing yield by taking care of the biology that's there more so than we do. Now in the future, if they can show me where we're out of balance and what we have and what we needed to get it back in balance, and they can, I can just buy that strain and that species and which ones do the heavy lifting, I'm all ears. I'm willing to listen. But until they can do that, I'm just looking at them like, okay, yep, mm-hmm. So we're, we're taking a little different approach. I have nothing after that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, but you're putting down literally. So you're adding biological life all the time. Right? Yeah, with manure. Right. Sure. Yeah. So, yes, we, we actually raise turkeys there, and, and um, you know, we have probably the best um, biological stuff you can put out there. Manure, constant, constant source on our farm, been there for 60, 70 years, you know, has been manure. So, uh, we're, we feel pretty like we've got pretty good biological action going on on our farm compared to, um, you know, some guys like them that have not had manure for as many years as our farm has had. So that's kind of, we contribute a lot of that to our yields, our high biological. So are your turkeys you're growing, I just, it just hit me while you were talking, you, you go to the fair and you buy them them turkey legs that are that big, is that uh, where that's, they come from? That's what we grow, yeah. <laughs> Matt? So a lot like David, we use uh, seed inoculate and, and an, and an infra inoculate on both corn and soybeans. We haven't tried it on the triticale yet, although now that I have the ability to maybe plant some wheat and triticale with my planter, I'm, we may try that this year. But um, it was interesting that Randy mentioned the native biology. We're actually going to start working with a company this over the winter to assess what we have on hand and see what we can do to propagate those species because we know that if I go out, if I harvest beans and I go out or I shell corn and I go out and plant triticale in November and I may only get this much growth. But if I come back in March and April, I may have 10% of the residue that I had across the, across the road where we didn't plant any triticale. So we know what we can do to promote that biology but it's just a matter of how do we fit that in our system. So. Oh, we are adding some biology kind of for the reasons I stated there a little bit before. There's a few bugs in the jug that we have bought, and I'm not sure I'm convinced on those, but we're making some of our own with a, like a compost tea now, and I definitely have seen ramped up activity in the ground. We're growing mushrooms on the ground and mold on top of the ground, and uh, I think we're uh, starting to metabolize last year's residue a lot faster. So you know, being as we haven't had the litter and the actual biology, we have based, and with commercial fertilizers, as I said with the salts, we've been basically sterilizing our soils instead of ramping them up over, you know, 30, 40 years. We've been sterilizing them the last 30 or 40 years. So I'm not saying fertilizer is bad, I'm just saying maybe we have to um, stimulate in, in our Midwestern soils uh, to get things going. And, and uh, cover crops is another great thing with uh, biology if you can keep, even in this climate, if you can get a crop of beans off and get uh, something out there to keep that soil alive, keep it growing a few months longer. Um, and that also helps with your organic matter and that, that just, it's a slow process turning the needle on that, but um, over three, four to five years, if you set yourself out and you're committed to it, you will definitely see a difference. One of the things that we've talked about doing in the last couple of years is is going out and frost seeding oats, which for in our climate would would probably be the best solution as a as a biological primer for our asphalt cash crop. So yeah, they're only going to be out there a month or two. They may not get super huge, but at least you've got something growing that the soil biology can come out of dormancy, to so to speak, and start feeding on that. That way, when your cash crops are planted, it, you've already jump started that. You're not waiting for your cash crop to get big enough um, for the biology. To, to utilize the sugar off the roots. Okay, I'm a novice. We're just getting started this year on tissue testing, so I'm a couple years behind you guys. Talk for a minute about your thoughts when you get back your tissue test. I know my instinct is I see it, I'm missing something. 
I feel like the sprayer is going to be warming up, waiting for that to come, you know. What do you guys feel about that? How do you handle your tissue tests? How do you make decisions? I know a few guys earlier this morning were talking about they don't get in a hurry. They'll see it not good, wait, wait for next week. Is that the approach you guys take? Absolutely not. That minus button's hitting every day. Something takes us from seven, eight hundred bushel potential down to what we're harvesting. Every day that that minus button hits, that yield loss is irrevocable. You do not get it back. So, I'm, the only way I look at anything is if I, if I have a lab that tells me they wash the leaves and I made an application and I wash the leaves and it's still extremely high from one week to the next, then I will take and look at it the next week to make sure there's not an issue. But if it ever comes back low, it's just not going to miraculously appear next week. I hadn't had the, the right prayer yet to have the good Lord send it from heaven. So. The bottom line is uh, we, we feel like you have to be proactive. You have to take a proactive approach. And the sooner you address those deficiencies, the better off you're going to be. Yeah, but you took tissue samples before to develop a database to know where you needed to be. Absolutely. So I think for those that are just starting, if they're not partnered with a group that knows that, they have to have some data set to start out with. And then when you notice that you start to see an uptake in nutrient the removal and your tissue levels start dropping, then you know you have to be proactive like Randy's talking about. In front of that sink, you can't fix it. It's already minus, like he says. So now you're either going to lower your yield goal for that particular season and then try to maintain a lower yield goal, or you start next year. Try to push that sink further down, and hopefully you don't get to that sink. Hopefully it's something you can control to story that, that minus isn't happening. Well, oftentimes when I get the test back on there, the lab has printed, it's high, I'm good. So there's things I don't worry about. Do you follow that? Oh, I mean, we've all heard Randy talk about labs and stuff. So, no, I don't, I try to not even look at whether it's high, low, or medium. I'm, I'm, I partner with a fellow that's saying that Matt Swanson did, Paul Bodenstein. So we're looking at ratios. And we know that if we have certain yield level goals, certain nutrients can't drop below a certain number. If they do, your goal is, you've, you've done, put a ceiling on your yield goal. Now ratios are a different thing. So we just, after that long set of database, you know, that's, that's how we focus it. And I think people that are starting, they just gotta have information to start with. Well, I, if, if you're just starting with tissue tests or you want to, I mean, it's, it's more of a roadmap for the future, future if, it, if it's something you're just starting with. And that's what they're talking about, the database. <clears throat> excuse me, you'll get to know your farm and what you're low in. And then uh, lots of times by, you, by the time you get something you're low in, you know, like you say you want to go, you know, you as a retailer might have the product sitting there, but uh, the farmer wouldn't. By the time he finds the product, gets it applied, you know, he, he've already, he's already lost yield or, or, or it's too late. With that year, several years of information, Maybe you figured out your fields and what you're going to be low in, so you can have that stuff there, have it ready, or have it already applied. So it's 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 more of a learning curve and a roadmap for the future than it maybe is for that week. It's it's an ongoing process. I would say for me, you know, compared to the rest of these guys, we're relatively new to the to the high yield game. So. In all honesty, I try not to be the smartest person in the room. So on as far as the tissue levels go, I look for somebody that was smarter than me, and that's why we found Paul. So that's why he looks at mine. So we use tissue tests right now. We're building the database for our soils. Paul's looking at them because he's seen higher yielding corn than I have. Okay, so that's why we do that. And then right now we're building and say, okay, at this timing, the last two years we've run short of this. So we need to make sure we either need to change the form if we're putting plenty out and we're not getting it in or we need to change how it's being uptaked, or we need to maybe apply something ahead of that to try to catch that before, it, before, it, before the knife falls, so to speak. Okay, anything you guys want to add before we open it up for questions from the floor? I want to give them a chance to ask you guys some questions. Is there any questions out here that somebody wants to ask? So the high mag, the mag levels in the tissue tests are about 0.5% on the, on the sample. So 
between point three five and point five. Okay, any other questions? For, I mean, for reference, using Paul's ratios, that would be 150% of what we would like to, of what Paul would like to see. Oh, right over here. Go ahead and yell it out. We'll repeat it. Yep. Well, there is, I'll let you have it. Um, in reference to the academic folks, no, because we're at yield levels that they they're haven't obtained before. And then the ag industry, you know, I think they're trying to catch up, but uh, we, you know, we just get the tissue analysis. We have an agronomist on staff, Paul, that does the ratios, but I, and I'm not taking Randy's thunder, but I know there's a group called Next Level, and they're they're starting to generate a whole lot of information from that. So, I think collectively we're learning. I mean, you got samples from Kev. I mean, Kevin's got his samples, Randy's got his, and Dan, and and you know Matt said he's trying to get to the high yield stuff, and myself. I mean, we've seen these levels. So now it's just collectively, can we put them together? And, you know, seeing other people's, you know, there are a lot of, there are other growers out there that are having high yields. There's probably some in this audience as well that just aren't talking about it because they don't want to deal with their landowners wanting more rent. <laughs> I deal with it the same, I deal with that also. So, uh, but academics know in the industry, they're trying, but they're not there. What we have formed is what we call the next level group. I see a lot of participants that's here that's participating. And we've got a group in Ohio, a group in Illinois, a group in Nebraska, and a group in South Dakota currently. That is projected to increase significantly. What that is is a group of farmers that collectively get together and they share management, tissue samples, everything with one another. Is that against the norm of what farmers are used to doing? Farmers like to keep the cloak of secrecy around one another and they don't like to share information. I understand it, I get it, especially for competition. David, how many times have me and you shared information? Every Since time you ask questions. The right question. The right That's right. right. So the, the, the thing about it is, um, competition is not a bad thing, but if a guy's a butthole and he's renting land out from under you and he's got a bad reputation for that, I kind of understand why you don't want to share that information with him. I kind of get it. But what we have put together is a group of guys that are sharing information. They're okay with it. They're starting to learn from one another. And if we got 500 guys in the group, let's put this in perspective. If we've got 500 guys in the group and they are all contributing their management, what they did, when they did it, keeping up with rainfall, sunlight, their tissue sample values, every one of them is going to have a yield of some sort, right? And if they've got all that data and everybody's got access to that data collectively in that group with one another, we just got 500 years worth of data in one year. One year. That's powerful. Because farmers are willing to start sharing a little information. Now, you want to be a part of this group? Where's Rachel at? Rachel, Shay, Shay's in charge of the Ohio group. She's here along with Brad. Brad, raise your hand. Rachel can help you. Denton, we mentioned this last year. Y'all remember last year when I mentioned this briefly? Amongst the group, Mike was proactive and he made it happen in Illinois. Illinois group, how many states we got contributing in the Illinois group? 10 to 12. We got 10 to 12 states coming here, participating in the Illinois group. Rachel's in the back, Mike can talk to you about it. Mackenzie, where you at? She's our resident expert with YMS, our computer program that does what? Takes in all the data and helps you learn from it. We put it together. This has been my brainchild. I've been putting it together for years. We finally got it into action. We're going to learn more and more and more, Lord willing, and it's going to help you start to know what levels you need to maintain for a specific yield goal. Because right now, you send your tissue samples off, it comes back from the lab, and it goes back to my famous question. What are the levels I need to maintain for my yield goal? If it comes back sufficient, is it good for 400 bushel corn or 200 bushel corn? The labs look at you like this. <laughs> they don't know. The university people look at you like this. They don't know. 
So how can you ask people that's never made the yields that you covet how to make yield and the levels you need to maintain? That's why we put these groups together to be able to answer that question so that you don't have to learn it on your own. Your turn. Speechless. <laughs> We give you that. You, you grow your crop all year long. You grow your crop, you notate GDUs. A GDU is a growing degree unit. A plant accumulates heat, it moves from one growth stage to the next. If it's at 350 GDUs in year one, year two, it's going to be at the same growth stage when it gets to 350 GDUs. So the plant moves from one growth stage to the next as it accumulates heat. All of our guys are instructed to notate GDUs when they pull the tissue samples. Now, Next year, they pull them at the same GDU mark. They're at the same physiological standpoint of life in that plant. Next year, if they're at 350 GDUs and they had 5.3% nitrogen and they were happy with their yield goals, then guess what? The next year when they get there, if they're at that level or greater, that is not their limiting factor. They worry about something else. So we're notating all of those things. We're taking a scientific approach to be a student of the crop, not just a recipient of what comes our way and how much rain we get. We don't just necessarily blame things on the weather. So we're learning. Hey Randy, you got a question on the ratios that you're talking about? You know people refer to tissue samples as like levels, but you're talking ratios here? They were talking about ratios. So that was <laughs> Kevin and oh, Matt. That was Kevin and Matt. No, it was me no. and Matt. I'm not or, Kevin. Or excuse me, Matt no. and David. Excuse me. No, that's my future son's father-in-law. That's oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> All kind of secrets are coming my way. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, One beer at a time. <laughs> yeah, y'all yeah, know my son's nickname? Have y'all heard this story? Well, you know, south of the base of Dixie Line. Do you have a nickname? Sure. Do I have one? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I know. All right. You can't say it. Yeah, that's right. You're not. I'm not gonna say what I call you. <laughs> no, but everybody has a nickname, and and my daughter's Christian name was Amber Nicole. So uh, Amber Waves of Grain. We gave her a nickname of Wheat. <laughs> you know, you got to plan ahead. About when she was six, we found out she was gluten intolerant. So then her, her son came about, and his uh, Christian name was Craig, and. My wife was trying to figure out what his nickname would be, and you know we were starting to grow cotton that time, and she figured it would be cotton. All you young fellows, you got to remember one thing: always try to outthink your wife. So I said, "Now we're going to nickname him Barley," and she's like, "Why Barley?" I said, "Because he's going to drink plenty of it before he dies. <laughs> he's living up to his name." So, but ratios. Um, you know, there are certain key ones. Now, I'm not an expert. That's why I, I surround myself with good people. we got Paul Bodenstein that does that. He's seen all these tissue samples. But we know there are ratios like calcium to boron, nitrogen to sulfur, phosphorus to zinc. You know, there's just these ratios. And, you know, you, like Randy just said, I, I had to step out for a second. But when you get to certain levels, that might be fine. But if you don't have a good ratio, then just because you got high nitrogen and you don't have good sulfur... And that's, that's not where you want to be. So there, that's why you got to partner. Find people that are smart and surround yourself with those folks. Okay, I want to switch for just a second to beans. I, don't, I know we've got guys that grow beans. Kevin, you grow beans too? Unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately. What about populations? We're hearing lots of talk about populations on beans. What are you guys, I'm sure you've been doing some tests or some trials. What are you guys doing for bean population? I sell seeds, so they can't plant it thick enough. Amen. Uh, we plant anywhere from typically full season beans from 120 to 160,000. Um, the higher the population, generally our number one, the only way we can shorten them to keep them from lodging is population. Uh, the lower the pops, we, we get a little more branching. We're on 15 inch rows on the beans. Um, part of our dilemma then becomes we obviously don't sell, or excuse me, when they're in 15 inch rows, they have a harder time of getting the same stand if they were in 30 inch rows. They don't have as much vigor and they have a tendency to break their neck sometimes coming out of the ground on 15 inch rows. 
So we have to bump the population up a little bit just to get the same stand that we would have on 30s. They have more pushing power when they're in a row where there's double the population um, versus 15s. Now, I think final stand, quite frankly, um, there's no reason you couldn't make 100 bushel beans pretty consistently with 100,000, 100, 110,000 final stand. Now, here's the problem I have with seed companies. Who, seed, who sells seed here besides David? Here's the problem I have with seed companies. Um, Y'all normally put 80% germ on the bean seed, right? Put the minimum standard. They put the minimum standard. Now, is that actually 80% germ or is it 95? I'd like to know the actual. Because if it's 80, now I can bump it up 20% if I'm shooting for a final stand of a certain number, right? But if it was 95, then I might have 15% more really than planted than what I really needed, right? Because for me, it's about final stand. And I would rather see that. Um, in my opinion, that, that helps me game it a little better going into it. Um, but 100, 110,000 final stand, I think that's where you need to be now. How many of those are gonna come up based off germ? Seed to soil contact, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, those populations, that's what I shoot for as a final stand, on production fields especially. So, um, we always have a problem with lodging from the high fertilizer manure and stuff there. So, um, I don't think I planted a bean this year over 105,000. Most of it was 95,000, just for standing issues. Um, they are standing somewhat better, but I got like 20 pet deer that's in there mowing them down every day for me. So, 30 inch rows. 30 inch rows. Um, or 15 inches, I know they'd been flat by now. So uh, that's about all I know about the beans. So about four years ago now, we started a trial where we started at 25,000 planted population in 15 inch rows and we went all the way to 200,000. Uh, almost without fail, the 75 to 100,000 final stand has been where we found our, our best return. If you get to 100, 125, you may get another bushel of beans, but it doesn't always pay for the extra seed costs. So that's, uh, that's about where we're running at. Is that crop interstripping or a monocrop? That's just in regular monocrop, yep. We, uh, we continue to drop our, our populations pretty much every year. Been downstepping 10 to 15,000 every year. Uh, I think that 100,000, like Randy said, is around the sweet spot. Um, this year I, I planted some at 115 shoot for 100 because of what they said on the bag and I got 114,000 out there so I would also like to see them put actual germs on the bags but um, the one thing we've noticed when you get down to ultra low pops uh, I don't know if you say 60 or 70,000 um, you might have 300 pods on a plant but branches for us anyway the branches will break off sometimes before harvest because maybe a branch might have 100 pods on it. So we struggle with that, so that's why we brought the pots back up a little bit to, uh, uh, to alleviate that some and try to, try to get that sweet spot in between uh, branching and just where you wouldn't get it with the higher pops. Um, singulation on beans, too, is, is as important as it is on corn. Um, I've slowed down my uh, planting of beans. I'm running three and a half, four mile an hour, which hell I used to run seven because I didn't think it made that much difference, but it does make a difference. If you go out in your fields, find a spot where every one of them is, you know, equally spaced and then find out where they're grouped a little bit and you will see a tremendous difference between those plants. So I'd encourage you to, to look at that. Do you, what do you use as far as what, what planter and what meters? It's a deer with this old e sets. Got the e sets? Yeah. You got a double hole disc or a single hole disc? Single. How many no, people? No, I'm sorry, I don't have the. I've got the. Uh, uh, no, it's not deer. Is it? Uh, what's the other one? Precision. 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 It's precision. You got double hole plant seed plates or single? Single. Single. Who's yeah. running doubles? Just about everybody in the room, probably. On 15s, you can get by with it with the single holes. It's a lot easier, but, or either you've got to slow way down, depending on your plant population and your planting speed. They normally put a double hole plate so they can get more seed out for the plant, planting speed that you're doing. Uh, we asked 
to get just that singulation that he's referencing, and he is spot on. We want them every two to three inches, whatever, based on our plant population. Um, we don't want doubles. We're not heel dropping cotton, as he referenced, we're growing cotton. We're not heel dropping, and there is a big difference when those beans are metered, and there is a separate hole for each one, as opposed to dropping a seed and it being carried to the trench and, and not having that controlled spill look in the field. That's a big deal. I would tell you, we planted uh, a field last year. We were doing some research work for another company and they wanted to bring their planter out. So by the time all that happens, like it normally does, it was May 29th before we planted that bean field. So we planted, um, it was a 3-6 bean, which for us is about mid-maturity. We did a variable rate by organic matter, essentially, because that was one of the things we were testing. And we did that from 100 to 125,000. And then we combine that with a straight rate of 125 and 150. The field, that particular field ranges CEC wise from 10 to 25. It has about 100 foot of elevation change from one end to the other. And uh, organic matter goes from one to th a little, almost four, 3.8 I think is what the top end of that field is. By the time you got it, took it to yield, there was absolutely no difference in yield between the 100 to 125 and the 150. Even plant, I mean, even planted at the end of May in central Illinois. Okay, Mike, neither you nor my, one of us has got to defend the seed companies this low <laughs> term. Y'all, just because the tag says it's 80%, we're going to put the minimum. There's a lot of tracking ability, so all you got to do is call your supplier, and we'll tell you what the real germ is. But it's just because of whoever, whatever agency comes may spot check it. You know, we just put the minimum. As far as one thing we didn't mention with the beans, I think a lot of guys are starting to do this. We plant all our beans before the corn now, which, uh, you know, we just started that two, three years ago, and we're, uh, we moved to a little bit longer maturity bean. Uh, it's extending our flowering period immensely. We started flowering around June 7th to the 10th, planting in uh, late April, and uh, there was still some flowering last week on group two, nine, three beans that those, those pods probably won't make it, but it shows you the amount of time for pod de um, development and, and the amount of pods you can get. So if you can plant your beans a couple weeks earlier, especially up in our neck of the woods up here, uh, it, it showed that, that it definitely pays probably seven, seven to 10 bushel on an average. Who has done the flag test on corn? Who's done the flag test on soybeans? If you want an aha moment, if everybody in here wants to go increase yields on beans and not spend a dime more, go look at how uniform the beans emerge. For most of you, you feel just like Kevin. Unfortunately, I grow beans. Right? Pretty well. It's a rotation. It's a necessary evil for him the way it sounds. But if you want an aha moment, look at how uniform beans emerge and look at the yields, look at the pod counts on those that emerge simultaneously versus those that are one or two days later. People that's been doing it on corn, are you starting to realize that on corn there's some free bushels there when it don't come up at the same time? If you fix that problem, it goes up for free. If you really want a Maalox moment, because most of us in this room do what when we get to beans? You planted all your corn and you're trying your best to get what? Finished. Who plants their beans at a lower speed than they do their corn? Who plants them at a hotter, higher speed? Mr. Hodel? I was going to see if y'all were going to say that. Um, I give Jeff and them a hard time. Um, uh, which one of y'all runs the planter? Brother? They pointing at each other. Um, bottom line is, it's a big deal. Get the beans up at the same time. There is free bushels there. Control depth. Treat them with as much love and care with the planter as you do corn. There's some big bushel increases by just doing that. So are you saying even emergence, what about space in that? Absolutely. That's why I went to the single hole as opposed to the double hole and dropping the, the like we do heel drop cotton in our area. I want uniform spacing. I want you know, consistent uniform spacing, and I'll all, I want them all up at the same time. And to do that, how do we get them up at the same time? 
How do we get any crop up at the same time? What's the first box that has to be checked? You got to plant them all the same depth, right? You can't have them out there at you know half inch and some of an inch and some of an inch and a quarter because you're driving six miles an hour trying to get finished. And if you don't have active downforce, such something like with hydraulic down pressure that can react 12 to 15 or more times a second, we got a problem. You can't do that with pneumatic or, or springs. It's a problem. I would say at my latitude, and I think Dan and I talked about this last night, I mean, I'm basically to the point now where if the soil is fit and it's relatively close to when we think we should be planting, we're going to be planting beans. And then when the planting conditions are right, we're going to be planting corn. Now, that being said, I plant beans two and a half inches deep, okay? So we don't have the temperature variation going through the field that you would if you were planting them shallower. But with the help of, you know, we put Delta Force on that planter we built this year. This is probably the most evenly emerged bean crop that I've ever had. And I actually had a landlord walk out. He still farms some to keep him busy. And we were planting beans and he said, well, I've been digging for 45 minutes. I can't find any. And I said, well, you got to keep digging. And he said, well, how deep are they? I said, they're two and a half inches. He said, they'll never come up. Three days later, there was 125,000 of them standing up out there. So that even temperature that we get planting deeper and more consistent moisture at, at my latitude and probably at Dan's as well, I think takes some of the risk um, out of planting beans earlier. Okay, we don't have a ton of time left, but I want to start with Kevin on this. I know Jeff, our resident Illinois state champion. Is that, has your record been broke? No pressure, boys. What is it? 350? 350, is it even? There's not a decimal point? 350.67. But you're not rounding, are you? <laughs> it's not that he's keeping up with it or anything. 350.67, no pressure, Dan, Matt. It's coming. We get back. I won't, he wants to ask a question. He's been pointing at me four or five Let's times. Go. So go ahead. No, go right ahead. Let's do him. Yeah. On the seed size, you know, as far as pushing like flat to the ground, more to buy moisture at the same time, are you still seeing that difference on even emergence to keep that? 1,000%. The question was on corn seed, is how important is it to have all the seeds shape and size be the same? It's imperative. If you want all the plants to come up at the same time, we gotta do what? We gotta control depth, we gotta control moisture, prevent crusting, we gotta have good seed to soil contact, we gotta have good genetics. I'm gonna pull that one out of David. For him, you just have to plant this particular seed company's bag of seed and it's just gonna happen. I've heard him say that two or three times. Yeah, but who's got the record? He's been trained well. <laughs> <laughs> Who set the bar that you went after? Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow. Um, we can have fun because we, we're friends. But the bottom line is, um, plateless seed is my enemy. Period. There is no reason, period, that there should be rounds and flats in the same bag. They do that because they want less skews. They do not want to handle as many bags and skews and lot numbers, etc. If they're not the same shape and size, they cannot imbibe water at the same pace and come up at the same time. That is free bushels. They know the planter will plant it. They know the seed will come up because there's a good germ on it. Now, do they come up at the same time when they're different shapes and sizes? It ain't gonna happen. So, how can we control the seed companies to make that change? Glenn Hertz, how can we do that? We spend money. We tell them what we want. Somebody has to start listening. Is that something? Sorry, didn't mean to get on another segue. That's <laughs> no, all right. One more question over here. And not all seed companies are created equal as to how they commingle seed. If you don't believe me, go open about five different manufacturers and dip your hand down in them and look. Okay. Even if they're not plateless, you can still si si find 1,300 seed per pound and a 2,000 seed per pound in the same bag. And you can find rounds and flats. So not all of them are equally bad. But I've had some guys get engrossed by this comment and they actually go get them a screener and they'll have five, six, seven different size seeds and shapes in one bag of seed. They're starting to rank them. You want your, that's the rest of the story.
The question is about even emergence in beans. Have any of you guys played around with infertile fertilizers on beans? Uh, I do use it. Um, it's been a learning curve. Uh, I started in for on beans probably 10 years ago. I uh, was getting along pretty good. Uh, one year, I killed my beans. I started ramping up my rates. Been there, done that. Went, uh, went from like two to three gallon up to, I think I, I think I only went to five or six, but I've got really sandy soils and there was no moisture when I planted, so the only moisture was the fertilizer. It took that up and it, it pretty well smoked them. Uh, since we still use Inferro, but have changed uh, the way we're doing it. Uh, now I have a precision, so, you know, what do they call them, their triple thing, the, uh, the furrow jets, I really like that. Uh, through the center orifice, we're just using a biological, and then through the wings, uh, we're, we've actually pumped some pretty good gallonages out through those, I mean, you know, maybe up to 12 gallon because uh, that is keeping it off the seed. It, it's still a very low salt fertilizer, but um, I personally have seen a yield bump from them. The reason, and, and honestly the reason it was one of those accidents, the reason I started doing it, uh, starter was still in the planter, did the first field of beans, it was like an eight acre field, a crappy field. Uh, went in and planted that little field, ran out the starter that was in for the planter, those beans made 80 bushel. They were some of my best beans. So um, kind of opened my eyes a little bit, and that's when we started. I, I started putting for a starter on everything. Now the one thing I caution you with is if you have already have really good fertility and you're putting starter on, those beans are going to get off to a really fast start, and they're going to want to grow, and they're going to want to elongate through their nodes, sometimes too fast. So there's a... Um, it, it might depend on your ground whether starter in uh, beans is the right move or not. I would say it's always the right move in corn, but I would say it's on your farm. You'd have to test it with beans. I would say this year since we switched to planting them in from the drill, um, we ran a watered down essentially 318-18 infurrow with some other stuff to support the biology. And then as an experiment, we also ran our two by two system. Um, I was very particular about how much in we put on because when we finished planting corn, I had about 10 acres left of corn starter that obviously the end concentration is quite a bit higher than what I would have used on beans. And I can take you and you can see the difference um, where we had the extra end versus where we didn't. I would prefer not to have had it, but we just ran with what we had until we cleaned it out. But I would say right now, I'm cautiously optimistic on what those look like. but. Uh, we have tried it. We didn't have any problems, any stand problems, uh, but we ran seven and a half gallons of total product, and 75% of that anyway was water. So. How water gallon of beans there fertilizer? Well, as I said, seven and a half gallon. There was probably five gallon of water in it, uh, around two gallon of fertilizer, and then about a half of the other stuff. And it's three eighteen eighteen, you know, three eighteen eighteen, not ten thirty four zero or anything that's got more salt in it. Well, the key is. If you're going to try it, most seed companies have a really good replant program on soybeans. So try a little bit. It's cheaper to replant. If you plant them first, then you can, you know, you're not going to miss too many important days. So Randy and I were just, I mean, he was talking about where he might have did a slip up on beans. And you just got to watch out what product you're using. So I can't overemphasize. Learn from somebody else's mistakes, but try a few acres first. The only reason we ran that much product is because the, the system, we're using twin V apply and on 15 inch rows at the speed we were planting, I had to put a certain amount of gallons on. So you wouldn't have to run that much water, I don't think, in my soil, but I had no other option. Who's your favorite corn warrior? She hadn't been born yet. <laughs> <laughs> she hadn't been born? Just playing with you. So what's the worst, what's the best and worst thing about being on Corn Warriors? Seth Wood would be the worst. Where are you at, Seth? He just woke up. Just woke up. Seth? <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, Seth's the executive producer um, of the show, and um, he calls me constantly. Where are you at? He had insult the injury. I need to come get some harvest video. 
I said, Seth, it rains every day. Well, I'm going to come Friday. Is that okay? You think we'll get some shooting in? I said, Seth, it rains every day. Can you tell me how much it's going to rain Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and the amounts that's going to rain, how much wind we're going to get, and how much sunlight? And I can probably tell you whether or not we're going to be able to run. So he asked for exact questions that I can't give him, but I'm joking. Uh, it's been a pretty good experience. Um, you know, uh, you see us kind of going back and forth with each other. That, that, that's been fun for me. Um, you know, um, at some point I think they're going to slip up and actually tell some of David's secrets instead of everything, him seeing it and approving it before we watch it. Um, I was kind of hoping that I'd get that from it, but I hadn't seen that yet. You got to join Yellow Nuggets, Yellow Nuggets, Yellow Gold, Yellow Gold, Yellow Gold, Corn Nuggets. Or yeah, something. then you'll see it. I'd say the best part, and I think most of the guys will agree with this, is just getting to hang out with it. These guys are a pretty fun group, and they're, uh, you know, getting to uh, uh, share knowledge and just getting to know them better and hang out with them. And uh, worst part is probably Seth and his crew can be a pain in the ass sometimes. <laughs> They, uh, they're kind of in a way. They, they break shit occasionally. My shop's always got their, their, all their equipment in there because they got to hide their equipment because they don't want the drones to see it. So I can't ever get anything in the shop when I want to get it in the shop and little things like that. But they, sometimes they feed you pretty good. They're, they're pretty good about that. But we, wait, we're having some fun doing it. Your meal? Yeah. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. I have to buy his meal. You kidding? <laughs> Every every time. (laughs) Every time. uh. No, I'll I'll say uh, definitely getting to meet these guys, which I've met uh, Randy and David before. Nice to meet uh, David or uh, David, Dan, and Matt. Um, And I think this is kind of a what everybody thinks. Seth is really a pain in the ass. Um, I mean, whatever you plan on, you think you're going to get done, just Cut it in a tenth, because you just don't get it done. But then, do it again. Oh, yeah, yeah, four or five times. Oh, this just broke five minutes ago. How do you feel about that right now while you're trying to fix it? Question, what would you like to see more of on the show? Give us feedback. I heard one young lady here in the lunch line. I went and got something to eat. I know that's hard to look at me and tell that, but... Uh, uh, she said, I like the show, et cetera, et cetera. I said, what do you think about it? What can we do better? She said, have more interaction with the wives, the ladies. I cannot wait to see Sandy Hula on this show. <laughs> I cannot wait. Because anybody that knows Miss Sandy, um, you will know exactly where you stand at all times. And um, I can't wait to hear her on the show. So that's a personal request by the young lady by the man in the red shirt. Uh, she wants to see more interaction with the ladies. Well, I was just grateful she didn't want to see more Kevin. <laughs> That's usually what I hear. Where's Kevin? Next thing you know, Kevin's going to take his shirt off. <laughs> I, uh, I, he's going to be a real farmer. He's going to have his overalls on, a spit cup, and no shirt. I, I kind of try to always to uh, <laughs> try to. Sometimes we got a darn near drag her down there, but I always try to make sure Melissa's in the. Uh, in the show because for one thing she's a lot better looking than anybody else on the show we'll agree. I did, I did, on in our location so Melissa uh, Melissa yeah I didn't here? mean all, overall I meant at our location and she's actually a big part of our operation she does uh, uh, I get a lot of knowledge from her and uh, she uh, she's actually my seed corn salesman and she, she, I buy some fertilizer from her and uh, y'all think he pays full retail it. on that seed <laughs> I think he's got a ring on her finger, too. Yeah. I don't think he's getting that. He's, you're getting that at a special price, right? Uh, it like costs a, a little more than everybody else. Yeah. That's right. No, that comes later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. That's it. There was that. So there was no, the good part was just hanging out. The bad part was working with Seth. Seth, I don't know. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Nope. Nope. He can't talk. Well, I appreciate watching the show. I appreciate seeing that somebody else has a problem once in a while. And what I think is really cool, and I've visited with every one of you different times, but you're willing to share and talk to people because I got a lot to learn, and I think people really appreciate, and all the guys that spoke here today, I mean, every one of them uh, are willing to share stuff, help educate, and uh, I, I really appreciate that. I'm sure these guys too, but I enjoy learning from you guys, so. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.
Got